before October 7th, no one believed it could have happened. During the attack, no one knew what was going on. Afterwards, they couldn't believe what had just occurred. My name is Hugo Goodridge, and you're listening to The New Arab Voice. The cross-border attack by Hamas was a deadly and historic event. It started in the early hours of October 7th, a barrage of rockets fired from Gaza into Israel. News agency AFP reported that the rockets came from multiple locations and were fired continuously for half an hour. In southern Israel, sirens sounded and police warned citizens to stay near bomb shelters. Less than an hour later, the Israeli army reported that a, quote, number of terrorists had infiltrated into Israel. They warned residents to stay in their homes. Shortly after the warning from the Israeli army, the military wing of Hamas released a statement. It read, We decided to put an end to all the crimes of the occupation. Their time for rampaging without being held accountable is over. We announced Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, and we fired, in the first strike of 20 minutes, more than 5,000 rockets. As the attack continued to unfold, Israel's defence minister, Yoav Gallant, issued an address and a warning, telling Hamas they had made a grave mistake and that, quote, the state of Israel will win this war, end quote. A subsequent statement by the Israeli army's spokesperson explained that they were facing an attack by land, sea and air. By 1 p.m. on October the 7th, emergency medical services reported that 22 people had been shot dead. That number would quickly rise to 40, with at least 779 injured. As news of the attack spread around the globe, world leaders expressed their shock, with many declaring that Israel has the right to defend itself. President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, addressed an audience in Bordeaux, France. I condemn in the strongest possible terms the senseless attack by Hamas on Israel. This violence is neither a political solution nor an act of bravery. It is pure terrorism and Israel has the right to defend itself. The European Union stands shoulder to shoulder with Israel. And, dear friends, this ordeal is yet another in the long list of challenges we overcome together. With the attack continuing, Israel launched airstrikes against Gaza. By 4.20 p.m., the Palestinian Ministry of Health reported that 198 people had been killed and over 1,600 injured. Hamas chief Ismail Haniye appeared on Al-Aqsa television. He declared that they are on the verge of a great victory. As the evening drew in on the 7th, the Israeli army spokesperson conceded that hundreds of Hamas fighters had broken out of Gaza and remained inside Israel. The death toll from the attack jumps to over 200. That evening, flanked by Israeli flags, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed the nation on television. The IDF is about to use all its force to destroy Hamas's capabilities. We'll strike them to the bitter end and avenge with force this black day they brought on Israel and its people. All the places in which Hamas is based, in this city of evil, all the places Hamas is hiding in, acting from, will turn them into rubble. I'm telling the people of Gaza, get out of there now, because we're about to act everywhere with all our force. By the end of the first day, reports said that more than 200 civilians had been killed. Overnight, 
Israel continues to pound Gaza from the sky. And by morning, Palestinian health officials report that the death toll in Gaza has risen to 313. In southern Israel, close to the border with Gaza, tens of thousands of Israeli soldiers start to evacuate citizens. Violence begins to spread on Sunday as Israeli forces and Hezbollah trade fire across the Lebanon-Israel border. By lunchtime on Sunday the 8th, the reported death toll in Israel has risen to over 600, and it is also becoming clear that hundreds have been kidnapped and taken back into Gaza. Over the following days, the scale of the assault would be made clear. In total, at least 1,400 Israelis were killed, including 1,000 and 33 civilians. Some were shot in their homes, others had their hands bound before they were executed. Men, women and children of all ages were targeted. In one of the biggest losses of life, at least 260 revelers at the Supernova Music Festival, just a few miles from the border with Gaza, were gunned down. Additionally, 200 Israelis were snatched by Hamas fighters, fate unknown. The events of October 7th were an appalling crime. The targeting of civilians is unacceptable and classified as a war crime. When Netanyahu returned to Israeli television screens, it became very clear that they were determined to root out and destroy Hamas, even if they had to destroy the entirety of Gaza to do it. But I assure you, dear citizens, at the end of this campaign, all of our enemies will know that it was a terrible mistake to attack Israel. What is done to our enemies in the coming days will resonate with them for generations. We always knew who Hamas was. Now the whole world knows. Hamas is ISIS, and we will defeat it just as the enlightened world defeated ISIS. This loathsome enemy wanted war, and he would get war. The response to Hamas's attack has been massive. So far, thousands of Palestinian lives have been lost to Israeli airstrikes, and the number goes up every single day. And the condemnation of Hamas's actions from around the world has been near universal, and it could be argued might have damaged the Palestinian cause. So it begs the question, why did Hamas choose to attack? I think Hamas wanted to gain something that they hadn't accomplished before. This is Joost Hiltemann. And I'm the program director for the Middle East and North Africa at the International Crisis Group. You know, Gaza has been under a total siege for 16 years. And during that period, uh, Hamas had fought Israel on a number of occasions, each time hoping that the international community, such as it is, would pay attention to the plight of ordinary Palestinians in Gaza. You know, it's a small enclave of 2.3 million people. But each time the situation simply got worse. There was destruction. The siege was not lifted. Israel kept the siege. So in the end, it was it all came to naught. And I think Hamas decided that this wasn't working. Successive rounds of fighting between Hamas and Israel have achieved very little. And with every year that passed, the illegal Israeli siege took more and more out of the Palestinian lives. And no matter how bad the quality of life became in the Gaza Strip, the international community appeared content with standing by. So I think it, it decided to go for broke and to say, we weren't able to accomplish anything in the past 16 years. We now need to do something entirely different. And the only way we can succeed is by doing something very bold and breaking through the fence, going into Israel, catch them unawares. Um, I think they were much more successful maybe than they, they had expected themselves. During their recent attack, Hamas fighters were able to travel for several miles from the Gaza border fence and were able to hold some villages for a number of days before the Israeli military were able to re-establish control. Uh, a massacre ensued. I don't know if it was planned, but it certainly happened. The Israeli reaction was would have been strong even without the massacre. Just the fact that Hamas broke into Israel would have produced a very strong Israeli response. 
because one way or another, it would have shattered their sense of security. You know, with the massacre, it was uh, worse, but all the same, I think Hamas got what it expected, which was a massive Israeli response. This is not Hamas's first rodeo, and they were more than aware of what the Israeli response would look like and the price that would be paid and is being paid by the citizens of Gaza. But it also expects that Israel may not achieve that objective and that before that happens, before it can militarily defeat Hamas and Hamas is very well dug in, the destruction of Gaza would be so extensive that Western allies, friends of Israel, would intervene and put a halt to the fighting and then come up with a solution because Hamas has made it already clear for years that it doesn't want to govern Gaza. So if it will not govern Gaza, who will? I think it put a conundrum in front of Israel. It's up to you. You are the occupying power. You decide. And it puts a conundrum for the international community as well. And the outcome is impossible to predict now, but I think that's where we are today. As the number of dead Palestinian men, women and children has grown amid a brutal and indiscriminate Israeli air campaign, voices from the international community have spoken out. But by far the loudest international voice has come from the streets. Protesters calling for an end to the Israeli bombing of civilians have attracted hundreds of thousands. And perhaps sensing the opinion of voters, some politicians have started to question Israel's response to Hamas's attack. But any attempt to push back against the worst excesses of Israel's response have been faced with the argument, Israel has the right to self-defence. A reasonable right. But it really depends on what you think self-defence means. It is uh, something that we all say, leaders say it, individuals say it, that every every nation has a right to self-defence, has an obligation to defend its citizens. This is Lara Friedman, the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I would say that just observationally, different people mean different things when they use the term. I think when, when it is used in the context of Israel's relationship with the Palestinians, the intention is to suggest that anything Israel does is only self-defense. There is never an offensive goal. It is And self-defense implies a righteousness, right? They did this to me and I am forced to do this which fits into a, a, a sort of framing that, that we've heard for decades. Um, the issue of self-defence has been core to Israel's argument since it started its campaign against Gaza. Israel must be able to attack Hamas, and this time round it hopes to destroy Hamas, to protect itself from further atrocities. And if that means innocent civilians, including women, including the elderly, and including children, have to die then that is what will have to happen. The question of what self-defense is, it, it's obviously a malleable concept. And for Israel, it is used as a shield to say whatever we do is legitimate. And if you are not supporting what we do, then what you are saying is you want Israelis to die. International politicians who have come close to questioning Israel's understanding of what self-defense means have faced fierce criticism from both Israel and its supporters around the world. And at different times, depending on the context, you will hear statements coming out of the international community, coming out of the U.S., coming out of Europe with things like, you know, we call for, you know, speaking out against dis, quote unquote disproportionate responses, which is essentially to say, well, there is there is a way to, to respond in self-defense, but don't go overboard. And at which point generally they are pilloried by um, Israeli officials and defenders of Israel for again saying you, you, you want Israelis to die. I think there's an awareness of, of what this linguistic tactic is, um, but there clearly isn't a willingness to stand up to it. The idea of what self-defense is, is a debate that will continue among legislators around the world. But inside Israel, angry questions are being asked as to why this quote-unquote self-defense is needed at all. How were Hamas able to pull off such an audacious and horrific attack? So it is quite remarkable that Hamas was able to keep this secret. They clearly used the segmentation approach where uh, they operated with cells who were given certain instructions, but not given a date, and were just told to prepare for and to train for 
a certain operation. And each knew what kind of operation that was for themselves, but not the overall operation. Obviously, when you prepare yourself for breaking through the fence, then you know you're going to go into Israel. But not, uh, not every aspect of it would have in- incorporated that. In any case, they, they were not aware of each other's operations necessarily. I don't know. I'm speculating because I, I don't have this knowledge from, from speaking to the actual planners. Uh, but if you look at it, that's what it looks like. Since the attack, it has been speculated that knowledge of the attack was kept secret from even the political wing of Hamas, who were only informed of it at the last minute. Planning for the attack is thought to have taken up to five years. And yet, Israel was taken completely by surprise. In spite of the billions spent on border technology, in spite of the drones and the listening posts, in spite of the human intelligence networks and the well-documented skill of the Israeli security services, and in spite of the fact that Egypt warned Israel that an attack was imminent, they were still taken by surprise. But the initial military operation of Hamas was was extremely well executed uh, in the sense that it uh, essentially disarmed the Israeli alarm signals and and electronic network uh, along the Gaza border, along the periphery. And um, whatever happened on the ground wasn't communicated directly to many other places within the uh, senior command structure. And so for the longest time, and the military leadership, they were not aware of the extent of Hamas's intrusion into Israel. And Hamas was able to go rampant, uh, to run, you know, to run amok, basically, uh, and to do what they did, which is horrific. But it was really a failure of, of Israeli intelligence that allowed them to get as far as they as they could, and the lack of military preparedness. And the lack in the end of of leadership, because uh, all of this goes back, of course, to the top. As intelligence failings go, this was both incredibly embarrassing and costly for Israel. Furthermore, it also represented a failure of Netanyahu's administration to understand and assess priorities. If it comes to Israeli priorities, the threat on the northern border is serious because Israel knows Hezbollah has tremendous military capabilities. But when it comes to the West Bank, the threat is much less, even though the resistance is there every day. But even the new generation of armed groups that we saw arise do not amount to a whole lot. They cannot pose an existential threat to Israel. But the thing is, Israel wants the West Bank and it doesn't want Gaza. So Gaza, in a sense, because it was less important, also didn't need that kind of deployment. In the end, that was a mistake, clearly, because they didn't anticipate that Hamas could break the mold the way it did uh, by breaking into Israel and then going on a rampage. But strategically, what matters to Israel is the West Bank and is the northern border, not Gaza. It's It's stuck with Gaza and it doesn't know what to do with it. Lara Friedman again. From an Israeli perspective, they came out of the blue. And I think for a lot of Palestinians, they came out of the blue, not because it's surprising that Hamas would engage in violence against Israel, in in violent resistance, which they they argue is their right to do, and not because there isn't um, some capacity. I mean, we've seen this with rounds of, of, of rockets coming out of Gaza, but I don't think anyone understood the capacity of Hamas to do this. This is beyond anything that they've ever done before. I don't think anyone understood how enfeebled um, Israel's defenses were, either because they became complacent and arrogant, or in part because they'd moved so much of their military into the West Bank um, to serve the the settlement enterprise. Um, But whatever the combination of reasons are, I mean, it it was a surprise. It did come out of the blue in that sense. But... Perhaps it shouldn't have come as such a surprise. Since the attack, as horrific as it was, many have pointed to the 17-year-long siege on Gaza, enforced by the Israelis, and the 75 years of occupation and oppression suffered by the Palestinians as a whole, and claimed that the price of such an endeavour could be attacks like those seen on October 7th. 
you cannot deprive a people, not just of their rights and their dignity, but of any, any political horizon for achieving their rights, their dignity, their freedom, and deprive them and, and of any means of promoting that. You know, I, I keep seeing things on, on social media from people who are not steeped in Israel-Palestine saying, well, why don't the Palestinians, you know, try nonviolence, you know, like Mandela? And you just want to scratch your head. And you're like, they've tried nonviolence for years. You know, you know, it, it, Israel, under, under Israeli rule, it, it's illegal for Palestinians to gather and hold nonviolent protests in the West Bank. International efforts to hold boycotts against Israel have also been shut down, branded as eco-terrorism. Palestinians have been repeatedly blocked from seeking justice and redress at international courts. And peaceful efforts in the past to break the siege of Gaza have also been met with deadly Israeli violence. If you take people and put them in a cage and deprive them of their rights, deprive them of any nonviolent means of protest, and deprive them of any political horizon, like a peace process that might resolve their, 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 their grievances, at some point, the only people who have credibility are the people who resist it by other means. And Just Hiltemann. Hamas, for whatever it did on October 7th, and again, that was horrific, and, and civilians should never, never, ever be targeted by any military force. But Hamas does represent Palestinians' aspiration to be free of military occupation and their wish for freedom and self-determination. So you can try to eliminate Hamas. Maybe you will even succeed in eliminating Hamas in the Gaza Strip anyway, because Hamas, of course, is bigger than just in the Gaza Strip. But it doesn't eliminate that aspiration, which is widespread among Palestinians in Gaza, but also in the occupied West Bank in East Jerusalem, and also in the diaspora, in the refugee camps and elsewhere. So if not Hamas, someone else will. So I would like to think that eventually... There will be a constituency in Israel. Of course, it has existed in the past, but it's it's marginalized now. But maybe it can become re-empowered and grow. That would see the need to go back to a serious approach towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But right now, I'm not seeing it. If we were to look for any sort of silver lining to come from this seemingly unending tragedy, perhaps, maybe, possibly... The Hamas attack could prove, once and for all, that the Israeli thinking and management of the Palestinian file is not working and needs drastic change. But every time the death toll rises, such a prospect moves a bit further away. Additionally, there are prominent and key figures in the Israeli administration who are proposing plans that are diametrically opposed to any sort of peaceful resolution. There was a, a leak from the Israeli Ministry of Intelligence this morning of a proposal by the minister to relocate Palestinians from Gaza outside of Gaza, to have them in the Sinai or in other countries, which, you know, when people like me started talking about this at the beginning of this conflict was treated almost as a conspiracy theory. Well, here it is. At, at this point, what we're talking about is an effort that is looks like it is a deliberate effort at ethnic cleansing, which is a war crime. And on top of that, the dehumanization piece of it is ethnic cleansing accompanied by a blaming of the victims, such that at the end of this conflict, you will have another set of refugees and you'll have had the world adopt the political framing, which basically says that their entire national cause is akin to ISIS or Nazis. The characterization of Hamas as ISIS, or even the Nazis, has been a common theme among Israeli government figures. But it's not by accident. When you understand that options like ethnic cleansing are being considered, you have to understand that this framing and the effort to dehumanize is part of a program of justification. The likening of Hamas to ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the Nazis right now in this context feels like a cynical, a cynical ploy to open the door for Israel to have, again, carte blanche to use the same sort of tactics that were used against ISIS and Al-Qaeda by the international community, which involved war crimes against civilians in those contexts as well. 
And that's why I think so many of us have been so uncomfortable with this framing. It's a framing that sets the stage for exactly what Israel is doing now in Gaza, which is saying this evil is so great and it is so woven into the fabric of this whole land, this whole area, that, sorry, we have no choice but to kill thousands of civilians, including children, including the elderly, including women. We cannot distinguish. We have to basically destroy everything in order to defeat this, this enemy. And, and that framing is deeply problematic. It was problematic. It's worth pointing out that while both Hamas and ISIS are Islamic organizations, that's really where the similarities end. And they have for the longest time been opposed to each other. The effort by Israel to justify their actions in Gaza have even stretched beyond their borders. Israel has done a very, um, a very powerful job framing Hamas's attack as an attack not against Israel and not an attack for, for any sort of national liberation reasons, but as an anti-Semitic attack against Jews. And the, the corollary to that is supporting Israel is the way you stand up to anti-Semitism and criticizing Israel is ipso facto, supporting anti-Semitism and supporting terrorism. And and that's, I mean, that very simple framing, I think it is, you know, appealing for people who are looking at something complicated and want a simple answer. But it's also saying, you know, here is your roadmap to not get accused of being anti-Semite. And, and as we look at things today where we're seeing a sort of McCarthyist um, backlash um, in all sorts of sectors against people who criticize Israel's conduct in Gaza right now, um, people losing their jobs, students being attacked. I mean, that framing is pretty powerful. Both the efforts to strip away any sense of a national struggle from the Palestinian people and dehumanize them as rabid animals and brand those abroad who do not support their military campaign against Gaza as anti-Semites all feed back into and seeks to bolster the previously mentioned Israeli argument of self-defense. All these efforts may well give the Israelis what they want in Gaza, but it will likely be too late to save Benjamin Netanyahu's political career. Well, if you listen to the debate in Israel today, uh, I would say that the criticism of, of Netanyahu is fierce for two reasons. One is that he did not... Well, he was in charge when, when the attack happened and he had not anticipated it or the possibility of it even. And secondly, because he has not yet done what the military command is asking for, which is the start of a ground campaign. In other words, they see him as hesitant and cautious, overly cautious. When in fact, what they are calling for is the elimination of Hamas, which in fact Netanyahu has called for, but is not in their view is not acting upon. On Wednesday night, Israeli forces did enter Gaza, but only temporarily, attacking a number of targets and then retreating. I do expect that once the, the dust settles, and sooner or later it must, that uh, the knives will be out. And then we'll get back to a situation that was already the case before October 7th, where we had a deeply polarized Israeli society with Netanyahu and his far-right government pushing for a judicial coup, essentially, uh, on one side. And, and much of the security establishment and uh, a significant part of the population on the other side. Uh, and now they have an additional cause uh, to battle for, which is that the leadership failed. Support for Netanyahu may be falling away inside Israel, but among his foreign allies, he can do no wrong, including war crimes. When it comes to calling out the war crimes that are committed being committed in the Gaza Strip by Israel right now, I think there is a clear political consideration. I mean, Israel has made absolutely clear what it intends to do. And, uh, you know, it has, in the United States at least, there's tremendous support in Congress. There's tremendous support in the legacy organizations um, in the Jewish community and the evangelical community, which will basically say, again, either you're with Israel 100% or you are with the terrorists. Today in the United States, calling for ceasefire is treated as supporting Hamas. Now that, that's it. It's, it's as simple as that. Today, there is a genuine fear that if unleashed, the Israeli army could commit genocide in Gaza. 
at that point, when you're killing thousands of people, destroying all of their, their civilian infrastructure, depriving them of food, water, and electricity so that life is truly unlivable, their lives are threatened just by existing in that, by continuing to exist in that space. I don't know how that doesn't meet that bar of, of an ongoing genocide. I think we've crossed that point. I think we've passed incipient to, I think we're in that, we're in a genocide here. And, you know, from the perspective, again, of, as an observer, the fact that world leaders are not only not saying ceasefire, stop, pull back, don't do this. They're saying we are 100 percent behind you in doing what you're doing. Keep going. You have to root out this evil. That sure seems to cross the line. And it's also it's not just world leaders. It's also the media. Following the horrors that unfolded on October 7th, it is understandable that emotions are running incredibly high in Israel. Among some lawmakers and parts of the population, there is a fervent desire for revenge and Palestinian blood. The current scope and indiscriminate nature of Israel's air campaign point to a nation that will not stop, no matter the cost. A cost that could be ethnic cleansing and genocide, which begs the question, who could stop them? Well, it is still possible for the United States to do that because whether we like it or not, um, the United States has that kind of influence over Israel. It can draw a red line because the United States, it may not care too much about the people in Gaza, even though it says it does, but it doesn't want a wider war. It wants the Middle East to be calm. President Biden cannot afford to have a war on his hands during an election year. I could be wrong about that. Maybe he sees himself as a wartime president, but frankly, it would not It would require the deployment of American troops, and that is highly unpopular in the United States. Um, so that could play against him. The attack by Hamas on October 7th was an appalling crime. The victims of the attack do deserve some sort of justice, but the path that Israel is walking looks set to repay those crimes with more, and perhaps even greater, crimes. Lara Friedman. I think people need to recognize this isn't merely about a massive loss of life, which Israel has made clear they don't care about. They view any massive loss of life as being Hamas's fault. They have no, they recognize no responsibility and no agency in killing any number of civilians from now going forward. That is what it takes to root out Hamas, blah, blah, blah. That's where we are. And the ulterior motive or the, the, the additional agenda of once and for all ending the Palestinian problem in Gaza by basically either kicking them all out or whatever's left is going to be a population that is so, so diminished, so impoverished, so demoralized that they're not a threat to anybody. And the international community is in charge of making sure they don't become a threat in the future because they're going to be living in tents and we're going to be worrying about just keeping them alive, not about whether or not they've got a national struggle. And final words to Just Hiltemann. What happened on October 7th was a symptom of that conflict. I wish that the conflict hadn't evolved in the 75 years or even longer, if you wish, uh, in a way um, that that targeting of civilians has become commonplace. It shouldn't be, but it has become part of the logic of this conflict. You know, and that is that is that is the real tragedy, um, because it makes any hope that these two people can live together in the same territory, peacefully next to each other in the future, that makes, makes it hope very, very difficult to sustain. Next week on The New Arab Voice, we examine Gaza, the fight for survival and the bleak future ahead. This episode of The New Arab Voice was written and produced by me, Hugo Goodridge. Our theme music was by Omar El Phil. The New Arab Voice will be back next week. Until then, you can find all our previous episodes on all major podcast platforms. You can also check out our Instagram page and Twitter account, both at The New Arab Voice, for additional content. We also have a weekly newsletter, which you can sign up for. Find the link in the show notes. You can subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And you can also rate and review. 
which helps us spread the word. Don't forget to follow The New Arab on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for all the latest news, analysis and opinion from the region 